Well, I would like to thank everybody involved in bringing me here. Uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful two days. Uh, over the years I was researching and writing uh, the biography of Catherine Ann Porter, I spent a lot of time in, in Texas and I met a lot of wonderful people. The hospitality was always extraordinary, but no place exceeded Victoria. Thank you all so very much. I'm uh, honored uh, and so very pleased to be a part of this reading se uh, series and to have an opportunity to meet so many of you. The paper I'm going to um, read this afternoon um, evolved a in a series of steps. I was convinced early on in my work on Catherine Ann Porter that her life was essential uh, to her fiction or to understanding her fiction, that she was one of those writers who drew exclusively on her own experience for her fiction, and that if we probed uh, deeply enough, we would find in everything she wrote that kernel of experience that inspired the story. Um, so beginning with that thesis, that idea, uh, I knew that the themes that dominated her fiction were betrayal and disillusionment. Um, her stories are part of a large scheme of journey toward enlightenment. Uh, and I also knew that there was, was pain in her life. And I became convinced that it was in that well of pain that she found uh, the themes of her fiction. So it, it evolved as a series of steps. I've called this paper <coughs> Marriage and Motherhood at the Core of Catherine Ann Porter's Art. <coughs> All of Catherine Ann Porter's stories and novels are to some extent observations on betrayal and disillusionment. Encapsulated in those abstractions are more narrowly self-betrayal, the failure of romantic idealism, and the ceaseless and unsuccessful search for home and love. Related to all those subjects is Porter's idealized concept of motherhood. Her own failure to fulfill it and the reasons for the failure constituted the most painful core of her experience and consequently created the most powerful themes of her fiction. Tracing the formation of that ideal and her betrayal of it illuminates her canon at sig significant points <coughs> of its development. Catherine Ann Porter said that when she was three years old, she knew that her mother was dead. That awareness, coupled with her father's telling her and his other children, if your mother had listened to me, none of you would have been born, convinced her at an early age that her mother, who died... <coughs> two months before the birth of her fifth child, I mean, after the birth of her fifth child, uh, had been a martyr to motherhood. She lost her life on this point of faith, Porter said. Catherine M. Porter's sanctification of motherhood was strengthened between 1892 and 1901, the years she spent in the home of her paternal grandmother, Catherine Ann Skaggs Porter, in Kyle, Texas, where her father moved with his children after their mother died. Grandmother Catherine Ann, spelled with a C and a second A and no E at the end of Ann, was also an irreproachable mother, having given birth to 11 children. Granddaughter Catherine Ann described grandmother Catherine Ann as saintly and credited her with forming her character. Behind Catherine Ann Porter's personal experience, of course, lay her paternalistic society's reverence for maternity, the cradle, a symbol of one of the twin roots to the altar of consecrated domesticity. Porter set out early in marriage, the only pathway to motherhood acceptable to her society, ready to achieve her own canonization as well as fulfill her starry-eyed expectation of marital bliss. But she was too young and too naive, and she chose the wrong man. She was barely 16 when she and John Henry Kuntz, who loved whiskey and other women, and for eight long years routinely beat Catherine Ann to the point of broken bones and unconsciousness, 
before she squirreled away enough money to bolt from an abusive marriage that included a miscarriage but no living child. Within two years after her divorce from Kuntz in 1915, her hopes for romance and by extension motherhood unquenched, Catherine Ann reached the altar two more times, both marriages ending also in barrenness and divorce. During the years of her failing marriages, Porter aimed her frustrated maternal desire at other women's children. The children she taught in small schools she set up, like one in Victoria for a few months, academies she called them, her sister Gay's little daughter Mary Alice Holloway, and John Kuntz's young niece Mary Hasbrook. Porter loved to have Madonna and child photographs made of herself and Mary Hasbrook and was said to be delighted when anyone mistook the two for mother and daughter. Mary Alice Holloway was yet a greater pleasure because Porter shared a blood tie with this child. And from the time of Mary Alice's birth in 19 and 12, she claimed her as her own. My adorable little child, she called her, and hoped to informally adopt her someday. But in 1919, Mary Alice Holloway died, and Porter was devastated imagining an important part of herself buried with Mary Alice. As the decade of the 1920s began, Catherine M. Porter was a woman alone, 30 years old, without husband or children, but still, amazingly, with a quixotic expectation of finding the perfect man and bearing his children. During that decade, she defined marriage based on her own considerable experience in this way. It has been made very easy to assume and fairly easy in the legal sense, at least, to abandon. And it is famous for its random assortment of surprises of every kind. Leaf-covered booby traps, spiders lurking in cups, pots of gold under rainbows, triplets, poltergeists in the stair closet, and flights of cupids lolling on the breakfast table. In three failed marriages, she had contended with the booby traps and the spiders, but she was still betting on the pots of gold, triplets, and flights of Cupid. The 1920s, however, were years in which she continued to endure disappointment. In 1921, during her first extended visit to Mexico, she engaged in an intense, amorous affair with the Nicaraguan poet Salomon de la Selva. <coughs> the, um, the affair ended in the spring when she became pregnant and chose to have <coughs> a guilt-laden abortion. She tried to console herself with hopes for future legitimate motherhood while she looked for compensations for her loss and guilt. It is not coincidence that the year after her abortion she wrote Maria Concepcion, her first original piece of adult fiction to be published. Maria Concepcion is a strong-willed Roman Catholic Indian woman who suffers a miscarriage after one, her swaggering, faithless husband, runs off to war accompanied by 15-year-old Maria Rosa, a young village girl. When Juan and Maria Rosa return a year or two later, Maria Rosa quickly gives birth to Juan's child. Maria Concepcion instinctively goes to the hut where Maria Rosa lies with her newborn child stabs Maria Rosa to death, and takes the child for her own. On the one hand, it is primitive justice that overrides both civil and church law. On the other, it is Porter's account of how a childless woman finds compensation in the only way she can imagine and thus displaces her grief and anger while fulfilling her maternal longing. In 1924, three years after her abortion, Porter became pregnant again by yet another Latin lover. And although, although she decided to carry this baby to term, the child, a boy, was born dead. During the pregnancy and its depressing aftermath, Porter wrote more stories related to her fruitless experiences with motherhood. She completed and published Virgin Violetta, a story about disillusionment and the conflict between spiritual love and physical ardor, and it includes an acerbic portrait of Salomon de la Selva. <clears throat> uh, she also drafted The Fig Tree, in which her autobiographical character Miranda 
buries a dead baby chick that she mistakenly fears she has buried alive, a metaphor for abortion. At the same time, Porter wrote almost all the stories she called Holiday, based on a desperate trip she made during her marriage to Kuntz to stay a month with the extended Hillendahl family near Houston while she recuperated from surgical removal of an ovarian cyst. The story finally became an allegory of women who live outside their natural role of procreation. The unnamed narrator of the story arrives at the Mueller farm which oozes fertility at the interstice between late winter and early spring and witnesses representative cyclical rituals of the Mueller women, Hotsey's wedding, Gretchen's giving birth, and Mother Mueller's death. Only one woman stands outside their circle, Adelie, the crippled, mute servant girl who draws the narrator to her dingy, bitter-smelling little room to show her a photograph of the child she had been before a debilitating disease made her what she is. When the narrator scrutinizes the photograph, she suddenly sees the resemblance to the rest of the Mueller family and knows that Audley is a Mueller daughter, just as surely as Hotsey and Gretchen are. Identifying with the ostracized, barren Audley, the narrator says her life and mine were kin. That is almost as much as we know about the narrator who has come to the farm seeking silence and escape from troubles too painful to name. When we look at the story still further through the lens of Porter's life, we also can read into it Porter's acknowledgement that she is different from other women, that physical traumas and losses she endured have made her, like Ottilie, an outcast from the community of women. In 1925, Porter was working on St. Martin's Summer, later retitled The Cracked Looking Glass, which discloses the ways she was finding compensation for her failure to succeed at motherhood. Rosaline, a childless, aging Irish beauty, married to an ailing older man, displaces her grief over her missing or dead male child or children First, in her devotion to young men who stay at her house as boarders or hired hands, and second, in the improbable tales she tells, sometimes based on dreams she has had. She justifies a whopper she has told an itinerant salesman by declaring, he wanted a story, so I gave him a good one. Rosaline is thus a kind of artist, and her foiled motherhood finds sublimation in the creativity of art. It is the earliest example of Porter's contention that art can supplant maternity. In 1926, Porter received her most crushing blow when she contracted gonorrhea from a short-time summer lover and was forced to undergo surgical removal of both ovaries, a then risky operation that rendered her sterile at the age of 36. She linked the operation to the death of her niece, Mary Alice Holloway. <clears throat> it was seven years between that sorrow and this, she wrote in private notes, acknowledging the finality of those two events that had been, she believed, beyond her control, but omitting mention of her lost babies of 1921 and 1924, both of whom she knew had been victims of her own carelessness. Porter's stories that followed the, her operation in the 1920s were increasingly sober statements about marriage, motherhood, and childlessness. He, published in 1927, is the story of a woman who also gives up a child, this one a mentally handicapped son, who is finally banished to the county home. Magic, published in 1928, is among other things an allegory of marriage in which a woman prostitutes herself in exchange for economic security that allows neither self-respect nor childbearing. Rope, published in 1928, is about a childless marriage and the power of hate in it. The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, published in 1929, reveals the final hours of Ellen Weatherall, who had a good marriage and became an excellent mother despite the betrayal of an earlier fiancé. 
in theft. <clears throat> the protagonist comes to accept responsibility for all her losses, both material and spiritual, after the janitor steals her treasured but empty gold lame purse, a Freudian metaphor for a vacant womb. In Flowering Judas, published in 1930, Laura denies love to the children she teaches, rejects romance, represses her sexuality, and embraces a revolution that practices death instead of life. After a jailed revolutionist dies by taking all at once the drugs she brought for his comfort, she is horrified to think she has become a life negator instead of a life engenderer in the ultimate repudiation of her female self. From 1930 through 1962, Porter created numerous fictional portraits of both successful and unsuccessful mothers while she tried marriage two final times and refined her feelings about the relationship between maternity and art. That tree includes a poet's idealized memory of his mother who inspired his art while his puritanical wife denigrates it. Hacienda presents Doña Julia, who has abandoned her natural role as nurturer and procreator in a modern world of decadence, corruption, and death. Noon Wine includes two mothers, pious, unenlightened Ellie Thompson and Olaf Helton's revered old mother in South Dakota, to whom he sends money that ultimately provides a trail for a bounty hunter to track him down in Texas. The Miranda Cycle, all of which was written in the late 1920s and 1930s, consists of Old Mortality, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, and the seven-sectioned The Old Order, in which grandmother Sophia Jane Ray Gay, based on Catherine Ann Skaggs Porter, is presented in all her maternal glory, alongside another uh, commendable mother, her freed slave nanny. Porter completed the grave, chronologically, the final segment of the Miranda cycle when she lived in Paris in the early 1930s. Based on a real childhood incident, the story recounts two related events eight-year-old Miranda and her 12-year-old brother Paul experienced during an excursion through the desecrated family cemetery on an expedition to hunt doves and rabbits. In one of the open graves, they find treasure an engraved gold ring claimed by Miranda and a silver coffin screw designed as a dove claimed by Paul. Shortly afterward, Paul shoots a rabbit. The children's delight with the treasure turns to dismay when Paul slits the rabbit's carcass and unveils tiny embryos. They were just about ready to be born, Paul says cautiously while Miranda trembles, instinctively identifying with the rabbit's femaleness, having understood a little of the secret, formless intuitions in her own mind and body. Feeling complicit in Paul's killing the mother rabbit and her unborn babies, Miranda thinks about the whole worrisome affair with confused unhappiness for a few days and then buries it deep in a psychological cave of painful memories to be forgotten for a long time. More than 20 years later, picking her way through a Mexican market, Miranda is intercepted by an Indian vendor who holds up before her a tray of dyed marshmallow sweets in the shapes of all kinds of small creatures, including baby rabbits. Miranda is mentally yanked back to that far off day when her brother killed the mother rabbit and they discovered her unborn litter in their embryonic sac. With the memory, she is reasonlessly horrified until she remembers the other experience that long ago day, the discovery of treasure in the open graves. Instantly upon this thought, the dreadful vision faded and she saw clearly her brother, whose childhood face she had forgotten, standing again in the blazing sunshine, again 12 years old, a pleased, sober smile in his eyes, turning the silver dove over and over in his hands. While the dove might traditionally represent a divine spirit, in this instance crafted with human imagination, it represents art as well. And the message is that in stories about dead mothers and dead babies, art 
subsumes the anguish. From 1939 through the 40, 1940s, Ford presented other uh, mothers and fictional other uh, fictional mothers in the Downward Path to Wisdom, published in 1939. The mother and the grandmother, along with nearly everyone else, withhold from the child Stephen the love that would have negated the hate he learns. In a day's work, published in 1940, the bitter yet delusional Mrs. Halloran sets aside her principles to support her useless husband's futile dream of reaping riches from political corruption, and she counsels her married daughter. Now remember this, Maggie, if anything goes wrong with your married life, it's your own fault. In The Leaning Tower, published in 1941, Charles Upton, a painter and caricaturist, thinks of his mother, as well as all other domesticated females, as an antagonist to his art. He had waged perpetual warfare with her because she looked upon his sketches as the enemy of order, wanting to straighten them out or hide them away in the deepest shelves of a closet. Through the 1940s and 1950s until its publication in 1962, Porter also was working sporadically on her only long novel, Ship of Fools. A satire in the spirit of Erasmus and Swift and an allegory in the spirit of Homer and Brandt, the novel's large cast of characters provides many representatives of motherhood, caricatures of it, and observations on it within the controlling motifs of home and love. It was Porter's final artistic comment on the subject. Long before her writing life had come to an end, Porter had concluded, like Charles Upton, that motherhood and art were incompatible. And she liked to see herself as a martyr to art, just as her mother had been a martyr to, to motherhood. But it was her failure to meet that maternal ideal that created a deep recess of pain in the repository of personal experience from which she drew inspiration for her art. Without this private anguish fueling her creative imagination, there would not be, in their same forms and with their same themes and textures, Maria Concepcion, the fig tree and the grave, flowering Judas and the cracked looking glass, he, magic and theft, holiday, rope, and the downward path to wisdom and ship of fools. We might say that the loss of those exquisite works would have been our loss. And we might say that Catherine Ann Porter's sacrifice and suffering were justified. We know what she said publicly in her last years about her satisfaction with the course of her life and its ultimate commitment to art, but we won't ever know what she really thought. Yes? I read some time ago that she was angry <coughs> with Victoria. <laughs> Could you tell us why? I, I don't know of any reason she was angry with Victoria. Um, she didn't talk about Victoria. Um, what we know about Victoria is really um, what we have learned from private notes and from uh, sources external to her. She lived here only a short time, about seven months. And um, as I discussed yesterday at the Bronte Club, it was during those seven months that she decided she really didn't want to be an actress. She wanted to be a writer. And I think the reason she came to that conclusion, it was a major shift. She was 15 years old, beautiful. She'd had a successful season in summer stock in San Antonio and much encouragement there. Uh, but I think that she borrowed from uh, the Bronte Library, Emily uh, Bronte's Wuthering Heights. And I think she thought, that's what I want to do. So Victoria was really important in changing the course of her life. And of course, it was in Victoria uh, at a Christmas dance that she met her first husband, John Henry Koontz. And that, and that altered the course of her life also.
Is it that? It was not that type of man. Mm -hmm. It was <clears throat> a, 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 what she wanted to be. Is she wanted to be an actress, and right. she wanted, and she she married in married with that idea. And she thought my uncle was very very rich. He was just starting his his work and everything. Mm -hmm. He brought her family in and wanted her family. I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> I don't doubt that she did that. I think when she uh, ran off from the marriage uh, in 1914, and of course this was when they were living in Corpus Christi, she bought herself some, some beautiful clothes and charged them to him in a Corpus Christi uh, department store. But what I'm, uh, she didn't have a lot to say about him. Well, I, she didn't say much about him, to be honest with you, except she said she feared for her life because she kept that marriage a secret. She didn't want people to, to know about those uh, early marriages. And the next two, the ones that lasted just a few months each and took place in um, Tarrant County and uh, in Dallas, uh, she didn't tell about either. She sort of collapsed all those uh, three marriages into one. And if she had anything to say about it, she would say, uh, oh, well, uh, my, those early marriages just escaped my, uh, escaped my attention. But what I based my uh, description of uh, John Kuntz on, and he was very young when he married her, and I assume immature. She was certainly immature, and I'm sure she was a flirt and hard to live with. But I uncovered in Dallas the divorce papers, <laughs> and in the divorce papers, she describes uh, the beatings, and she describes very specifically being thrown down um, a stairway in Houston and being beaten unconscious with a hairbrush. He signed them. He signed the divorce papers and said that he was guilty of those things. So I have heard from other people that he became a very nice man, had a nice marriage and uh, a nice family, but in... 1915, he signed those papers agreeing with the charges. So my evidence was simply objective, external kinds of evidence, and uh, I've long wanted to meet. Um, when she <coughs> left the marriage, when he met, when she left him, mm -hmm. she just left him. She oh, yes, she did. <laughs> she did. not divorce him or anything. No. Years, years before the game. And he, no. he probably just signed the papers, never even breathed. <laughs> Well, I, I hope that's not the case. That's always dangerous not to read the fine print. But you want out of a marriage like that with all the family coming in. She brought her family into him to support also. She could not possibly do that. Well, of course not. Now, the the city directories that uh, covered the years of their marriage don't indicate that any of the porters uh, lived with them. They lived in apartments above. Uh, drug stores and such okay. places, and, and uh, she may have had that idea. She may have thought. Well, the evidence doesn't really suggest they ever lived with them. And, and Harrison, her father. Well, well, I don't know. He was 19, I guess, when they met. Uh, 20 when they were married. She was 16 when they married. And uh, that was in 1906. And, and the marriage lasted until 1915. But she didn't run off. She didn't bolt from the marriage until 1914. And when she ran off, she ran off to Chicago. Uh, and she, uh, she got a job uh, briefly, as it turned out, with the Chicago Tribune. And the editor there sent her to the SNA studios on the outskirts of Chicago to write a story. <laughs> article about a movie that was being produced. And when she got there, uh, and she was dressed in this outfit that she had bought in Corpus Christi and charged to John Kuntz, and it was bright blue, and the director said, well, little boy blue, would you like to be in the movie? And so uh, 
he said, we'll pay you $5 a day, and the newspaper was going to pay her $5 a week. So she thought, well, this is a better deal. So she said, yes, she would be in the movie, but she was relegated to um, uh, an extras uh, position, it seems, and uh, uh, she didn't like it very much, and she finally decided she wasn't going to be a star, so she wasn't supporting herself very well. So she returned to Dallas at that time, and that's when she completed uh, the dissolution of the marriage. But she didn't run away until 1914. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. It was just from everywhere and everything. Well, can't you pay so and so much, you know? And and he he wasn't she just imagined that he was a a millionaire at that time. And so she just threw money away. Well, he was nineteen years old and he worked for the Southern Pacific Railway. I it's hard to believe she was so dumb to think he had that much money. But uh, in any case I would love to meet more of the Kuntz family. I would love to see any documents, any papers or photographs you have. I've always uh, been interested in, in hearing more from that side of the family. Yes? How did you come to study happening? Well, it, it just came about naturally. In 1975, 76, I was a newly minted PhD, and um, I was teaching Catherine M. Porter's stories in my American literature class. And, um, I met her in 1976 at um, Howard Payne University where um, a celebration in her, uh, near her birthplace had been planned. And um, there was so much work to do about her because people didn't know much about her life and there hadn't been really any critical books written about her uh, that were very thorough uh, at that time, two or three very small books, and it seemed like um, such an exciting area of research and there was so much uh, to be done that I uh, shifted gears. I'd been working on Henry James and so uh, I started researching and writing my first critical book and uh, uh, at that time I wasn't interested in writing a biography. I just kept gathering her works and uh, doing editions and writing other critical books and uh, then in the early 90s, I began to find errors in the existing biographical uh, record and also gaps, and I decided that um, a new biography was in order, an additional biography, and so I started from scratch at that point, and I, I didn't um, accept anything as fact without finding some kind of external uh, validation. It took me 12 years to write it, and I spent a lot of time uh, in Texas. I didn't get to Victoria, and I always felt as though that I had missed something by not being here, and so I'm doubly grateful for the opportunity uh, now. Yes. Mm -hmm. The emerald. Well, let me just say this. My husband, who's here, bought me this two-carat emerald ring when the biography was published. And, <laughs> and, and Catherine's Anne's was 22 carats. So I like to hold this up and say, envision if you can, something that was 10 times that big. And uh, uh, it, you know, the sad thing was, the emerald was her birthstone. And her birthday was always very special to her. She always celebrated it and, and uh, acknowledged it. And she always wanted an emerald from the time she was a little girl. And so when she had the money, finally, with the publication of Ship of Fools, it was the first thing she bought. Um, it was sold, uh, someone asked me yesterday, whatever happened to it. In her last years, uh, the money ran out. She was terrible with money. She wasn't a good manager. She splurged and she uh, gave money away and, and, and didn't manage it. Let's, let's just uh, summarize it in that way. And so her nephew, who was her guardian by then, uh, had to sell it to help pay for her keep and he said uh, and he's still living uh, incidentally he lives in in Houston he's uh, up, up in years about 90 now but he uh, he provided so many of the family papers and and photographs to me but he said that when he sold it that it hadn't really been worth what she paid for it she didn't get that pure emerald that she had she thought she did but she loved it she wore it uh, she wore it as, uh, everywhere she could for as long as like, she had it. And she lived about 18 years after Ship of Fools, so she got to flash it around a good bit. <laughs> what year did she die? 
She died in, in 1980, born in 1890 and died in 1980, so 90 years old. No, she, she was a consultant for a while, uh, and she was uh, living in Italy uh, the year that the, the script was being written, and Abby Mann, who wrote the script, visited her in, um, in Italy and consulted with her on the writing of it, but she didn't, uh, didn't write it. And I don't know what she finally thought of it. Uh, it's, it's really a fine movie, and it's still available in uh, at Blockbuster and Netflix and places like that had its, an amazing cast, Lee Marvin and Simone <coughs> Signore and uh, many, many really fine actors. And it won several Academy Awards, yeah. Um, I heard her say in Brownwood at this um, symposium um, that she loved it, but I heard her say on other occasions that she hated it. So I don't really know what she thought about it, but uh, there are changes made, uh, as there often are between a, a book and its adaptation as a movie. Uh, but she didn't really have anything to do with the writing. Long answer to your question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes? Well, you know, she was really old then. She was, um, <laughs> she, was, um, she was 86 when I met her, and she had only four more years to live. But do you know, even at 86, she was stunningly beautiful. And very uh, gracious, she had a lovely voice, and um, she could hold a crowd in the palm of her hand still. She spoke at the birthday banquet in her honor, and she spoke and spoke and spoke for 45 minutes, and uh, the president of Howard Payne had his personal physician sitting on stage um, beside of her in case she became overwrought, which uh, she was inclined to do. <laughs> Uh, but she was an amazing woman even at that point. Of course, a couple of years after that, she started having strokes. And, uh, and that changed her personality, and, and ultimately she became bedfast. But in 86, she was still pretty good. She was, uh, she, this was in Brownwood, and, and uh, Howard Payne was uh, controlled by a Baptist uh, uh, board of trustees. And she... Uh, she wanted to take them all out for champagne, and <laughs> so he had to finesse that a little bit. <laughs> One more question. Uh, what what uh, separates her for you from other writers, uh, similar to her, like Captain Man, or I think that um, it's the quality of her art, um, and there is. A, a classical precision in her art that we don't find in, in many writers. It's always the perfect word, uh, the tightness of the structure, and she didn't uh, shy away from writing about very painful uh, things. One of, um, one of her friends read my manuscript and said, oh, I wish you would shorten the last part of it where you describe her death. It was very painful to read. And I said, I couldn't do that to her, that the woman who wrote The Jilting of Granny Weatherall deserved to have her own death treated with thoroughness and respect. So the truthfulness, the precision, and I think the sheer power and beauty of her writing, um, a kind of classicist um, in, in the modern sense. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.